I'm Connor Rebush, and if you are interested in the finer points of face punching, you've come to the right place. This is Heavy Hands. Hello and welcome to another episode of Heavy Hands. I've, I'm apparently back in the habit of mentioning the number of the episode before the show begins, so I believe this is 141, and uh, look forward, all of you listeners out there, to the imminent day when I start forgetting which episode it is, now that I've gotten myself into the habit. I apologize if you can hear the police sirens outside, but that is Cincinnati, and I am Connor Rebush, your host. With me is Patrick Wyman, and today we have an interesting smorgasbord of topics to discuss with and for you. Um, to start off, we're going to be talking about a selection of fights from the upcoming UFC Fight Night card, also called UFC Rodriguez versus Penn. It's not a great card. In fact, if you were to look at the bottom six or seven fights and, and consider that that is how you would spend the first three hours of your evening, it may be the worst card that UFC's ever done. But the main event has some interesting narratives going on. There are a couple of other interesting fights in the card that we did want to spend some time discussing. And then at the end of today's show, we are going to answer some questions from you, our listeners. So uh, if you want questions answered on a future episode, make sure you pledge $5 on Patreon. That is a way to get a guaranteed question answered once about every three or four months when we uh, restart the cycle. But uh, that'll be great. And now let's start off talking about BJ Penn. Uh, it's almost hard to gear up for it, Pat, because it's the end of the line for BJ Penn, and he's still trucking along, or still still thinking about trucking, and 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 kind of like showing up in the cage, having forgotten his truck and his hat. But uh, <clears throat> here's the question I want to ask you, Pat, to start off our discussion here: Is BJ Penn has he become terrible, or did the third fight with Frankie Edgar convince us? that he, he's always been, in the last twilight of his career, that he's been worse than he really is. Because that, to me, I kind of realized today, is a super bizarre performance that is really, really odd. But the ones before it are not, like, shamefully bad. So yeah, is, that was... can BJ Penn come back, and can he look like he did, say, in the Nick Diaz fight now in 2017? Or is it too far gone? Can we expect just different iterations of the Edgar Three Penn to show up? That Nick Diaz fight was five and a half years ago. That was before that fight was yeah. the pay per view before uh, Shogun Hendo won. I just realized that was in 2011. <laughs> that was that was five and a half years ago. How old um, is no, with BJ that said, Penn? I do think that that was that the third Edgar fight was an uncharacteristically bad performance. Like there was no reason. I don't understand what he was trying to do with his footwork. Bath. Um, by it, he said that Mike Dolce screwed up his weight cut and had given him diuretics and he couldn't rehydrate after afterward. Nothing else um, had happened had anything to do with the mind-bendingly strange tactical choice that he made going into that fight. I don't know who told BJ Penn how he got it into his head that standing with his feet four inches apart from one another, knees unbent, on his toes was the best way to fight. Against a guy who was obviously going to try and duck under and take him down. Yeah. Like it did left he him think vulnerable that he to could takedowns. Only win that fight on his back, and that was why maybe to... it left him vulnerable to takedowns. It meant so it meant he couldn't pressure and cut off the cage to get after Frankie, and he couldn't really evade when Frankie came after him. He had no options. That was a fight that BJ was always going to lose. It's... That was not a fight that BJ needed to lose that badly. Yeah, it's not just a stance that's bad for for some secret MMA reason. It's just not an athletic position for the body. Imagine a football player or a, even a basketball player where it helps to be as tall as possible standing the way BJ Penn stood against Frankie Edgar the third time around. It was I, I have... very strange. I have not the foggiest idea why he chose was, to do that. And it Jason makes Perillo, no sense. Jason Perillo had to publicly disown that uh, tactical decision mm -hmm. after the fight to save his good name because he Which said, thank "Look, God, he did right. I came in for a week at the end of camp. I didn't have anything to do with that, and I did the best I could because it was too late to change the crazy shit that BJ's friends had let BJ get into his head. Um, but now he has been with Jason Perillo, I believe, for the duration of the camp." Uh, even BJ Penn is sane enough to realize that that didn't work as well as he'd hoped it would. And so now I think he is actually training with Jason Perillo, who we have praised numerous times on this show. 
uh, for working with Michael Bisping and Cyborg, uh, uh, working on their technique and everything. And the weird thing is we've never discussed BJ Penn on this show, which I guess shows you how both how far gone the golden days of BJ's career are and how new this show is. Yeah, I mean, we started doing this show together in October of 2014, and BJ last fought in July of 2014. Yeah. So that doesn't feel like that long ago, but I guess it kind of was quite a while ago. Um, so take that as you will. But yeah. yeah, I don't think there's any reason to expect BJ to look that bad. The question is, could the BJ who fought, say, Rory McDonald, I think that's a reasonable standard for BJ to sure. for BJ to hit skill wise. Could that BJ Penn compete with a 24 year old Yair Rodriguez? No. No. OK, that's, <laughs> that's my gut. Or, feeling. The, or the BJ who fought Nick Diaz. Could that BJ yeah, compete no. with Yair Rodriguez? But maybe compete. And that's that's I mean, I'm, the most we can hope for really uh, is for BJ to at least be competitive with Yair because Yair obviously is the next generation. He's this exciting fighter. Um, the most we can hope for is that BJ Penn shows up and does what a fighter in his position should hopefully be able to do, which is use his age and his experience, his craft to surprise Yair a few times. And maybe even if he gets really, really lucky and he's really clever, steal a chance to uh, to try to finish him. Maybe. So if you're... Let's so let's assume that BJ is not going to look like he looked against Frankie Edgar. I think analytically it would be a mistake to assume that BJ is going to look that bad, yeah. right? So let's give him the benefit of the doubt and say that he looks more like the previous two iterations of him that we saw in the cage. More like a How slower does, version of classic BJ Penn. Yeah. So <laughs> what does that BJ? Or how could that BJ Penn win this fight against Jair Rodriguez? Where does he have the best chance of winning it? Um. The ground, it's tough. It's tough okay. to imagine me. Uh, it's tough for me to imagine BJ Penn using his his uh, what is traditionally a, his striking has been defined by his boxing, and it's tough to imagine me. Tough to imagine me. Tough for me to imagine BJ Penn using his his classical boxing style to beat Yair Rodriguez because BJ has always um, he's always waited a lot and kind of relied on countering and let his opponent dictate the pace of the fight. Mm -hmm. And in Yair Rodriguez's last fight, we learned a couple things about him. Um, I, one thing I guess we already knew, which is that he relies very heavily on his kicks and long lunging punches and long diving takedown attempts, and everything really happens from long range. And while he may be there to be countered, um, He's also going to get a lot of opportunities to set his distance and tee off with strikes that are difficult to counter. Side kicks, front kicks to the chin, stuff like that. Uh, the other thing we learned is that he can actually do this crazy shit for five rounds. And that's a pretty scary prospect uh, because Alex Caceres pushed him and seemed to be stealing the momentum. And Rodriguez never let him get a hold of it. And so... BJ giving Rodriguez, an older, slower BJ, giving Rodriguez time and opportunities to set his long-range strikes and not being able to keep up with him down the stretch um, because, you know, five years ago, he wasn't able to keep up with Nick Diaz and Rory McDonald. I doubt he'll be able to do it with Yair Rodriguez now. It's hard to imagine him outstriking Rodriguez in any way. Yeah, so I'm a... Uh... Yeah, that is the most likely outcome. There are still moments of danger in there for Rodriguez because yeah. uh, as good as Rodriguez is at long range, and BJ has no tools to compete with Rodriguez from outside. Like a, even a prime BJ would have struggled with a yes. long rangey striker who wasn't going to let BJ into the pocket. Like because that's what we saw with BJ on the feet against George St. Pierre in their second fight. Yeah. Right? Um, if for the for the brief periods that that was on the feet, it was GSP, a similarly sized fighter to Yair Rodriguez, like a little thicker and more muscular, but about the but but actually I think maybe an inch shorter. Maybe, so, yeah. yeah, I mean he he struggled with GSP's jab, he struggled with his Superman punches, he struggled with the kicking game, um, and Rodriguez can do that at a higher pace and faster than GSP did it in two thousand nine, so. There's that. But this was always going to be something that BJ might struggle with. Now, Rodriguez, when he gets into the pocket, is hittable. Like, he moves his head, but he's kind of inconsistent with it. It's not real, what I would call, organic head movement. Yeah. It's athlete's head movement inside. So 
if BJ can time him, BJ can land some counters. Like they like Rodriguez is there to be hit. If BJ can get his get a pressure game going, not that I think he'll be able to, but if he could pressure Rodriguez, he could hit him against the fence. Uh, Rodriguez is hittable when he doesn't have space to move. Mm-hmm. Is that likely? No, not especially, I don't think. Um, but those are paths to victory there. Now, the grappling is going to be the best thing. And this is where Rodriguez could easily get himself in trouble. BJ has not forgotten how to get to your back, I'd imagine. And um, Rodriguez is going to give you chances if you can make him scramble. Like, he is vulnerable in transitions. He takes chances. That's uh, He believes in his athleticism. And that is both the strength and the weakness yeah. of his grappling repertoire. He's incredibly creative. But there are chances in there for a veteran, experienced, fundamentally sound grappler like BJ. Yeah, I don't know that BJ Penn has ever um, earned the kind of accolades that like Damian Maya gets nowadays for his grappling prowess. Um, I don't think he's ever been that effective at out grappling people who don't want to be out grappled in MMA. It's often been like a much like his boxing. It's often been reactive, countering somebody, messing up their position, stuff like that. Um, but it is worth pointing out that BJ Penn is a pretty freakishly prodigal grappler. I mean, uh, the the guy, what did he go from from no experience to black belt in three years? Um, like three or four, four years, something like that. I right. don't know, some ridiculous short period of time. Right. In 2000, I think this was, yeah, like three years or so after he started training, he won a gold in a world championship in the black belt division. The guy is a, is a, is a natural on the ground. And so uh, yeah, I can definitely see an opportunity there. The, the problem is, is that again, because of BJ's fighting style, it's hard to see him dictating anything in the fight. Everything BJ does, uh, this stands out more and more, the more you watch his old fights, but everything he does is, is sort of waiting on the other person and then countering them. And maybe that's maybe that says something about BJ Penn, the the classic aphorism of, about Penn being that he's he's not a hard worker, but he's a great athlete. And maybe that's it. Is like he doesn't really have to learn how to beat you. He can just have good enough timing and speed and power that he can clip you on the way in or find his way to your back and not really have to worry about strategizing. But that has increasingly been less successful as he gets older. And I say that having seen him as only as recently as 2014 when he looked god awful. The last time I saw him and he looked okay but still lost badly was was uh, four or five years ago. So mm-hmm. BJ Penn losing his athleticism, he would really need to redesign his style, I think, to compete with Rodriguez on the feet. And I think he would need to compete with Rodriguez on the feet to uh, to some degree at least to have a chance of finding his opportunities on the ground. I mean, Rodriguez, yes, he's open on the ground. He's a little too aggressive. But if it is Rodriguez constantly deciding when he shoots and how it goes to the ground and getting to pick his positions and forcing BJ to do nothing but play guard, then it mitigates the risk a lot. Yeah. BJ would need to get to top position. Yes. If he wanted to do this. I don't think BJ from his back, as tricky as he is, um, I don't think that he can make that work. That for... the guard game hasn't worked in a long time. I mean, yeah, when you... was the last time BJ was really, really dangerous from his back? It's been a long time since yeah. that was really something people had to worry about. So, um, I would say, but BJ has always been kind of an underrated offensive wrestler, and Rodriguez's takedown defense is, I would say, kind of right around average. Like, it's hard to keep him down because he's so scrambly and he's got a good guard of his own, but like, Yair Rodriguez is probably not going to submit BJ Penn from his back. Yeah. Um, But still, like, you've got to get in position to shoot those takedowns if you're BJ, and that's what he would need everything else to to do. So I don't know how much training he's done at Jackson Wink, but I think he was there like three months ago. Um, But I don't think he's been there for any of this camp. I asked Brandon about BJ and how BJ had looked, and he said, you know, he actually looked pretty good. the question is whether you can make him fight like it's not 2009. Right. So, and I think that that's going to be the big hurdle for BJ to get over. Does he, in his head, is he still the BJ Penn who went out and beat the crap out of Diego Sanchez and uh, Kenny Florian? Is he, does he think that he's still that guy? If he does, then nothing else is going to matter. If he, cause he's not that guy anymore. He, he's he pretends, obviously a, he a proud man who has a sort of untenable uh, view of his own, an untenably high view of his own decision-making 
because only that kind of person could have possibly approached the the rubber match with Frankie Edgar the way BJ Penn did. There's no other kind of I mean you have to be have ridiculous self-confidence and and really feel like you know better than everyone around you to do that. Yeah, yeah BJ Penn great fighter, one of the all-time great fighters in MMA, but even he is not immune to the remorseless logic of the aging curve. Definitely. Yeah, and uh, so let me before just before we move on, let me ask you uh, about BJ Penn. Because now, uh, I think BJ Penn, once upon a time, was like a lock for one of the greats of all time. Um, but I think that was back in an era when when Randy Couture, too, was like an easy goat status, you know, with his with his sort of middled, muddled record and everything. And I think both guys deserve to be in the discussion, but how do you actually feel about BJ Penn as a fighter? Like, what do you think his best performance was, and do you think he was ever consistent enough to actually belong in that pantheon? I think he is a great fighter. Do I think he's a goat? No, huh? Um, for me, right now at this point in time, the goats are GSP, Jose Aldo, and uh, Anderson Silva. I think, and I guess Fedor would be kind it's of tough a distant to compete with, like like GSP, Fedor, uh, Anderson, and Jose. That's a, I mean, that's a hell of a tough lineup. To compete with when yeah. you're you're talking a guy whose record is like 19 and 11 at this point. Yeah. B, yeah, BJ is just not on that tier with me. I think he's I think he belongs more in the pioneer tier than he does in the like this is a mature sport tier. If that makes sense. Sure. Yeah. More in the um, Ronda Rousey class. Pioneer more so than. Yeah, I mean, because like BJ, I I think that he is one of the rare examples of a dominant champion where we saw so clearly how the game passed him by. Mm -hmm. Um, Like the first fight with Frankie Edgar, having just rewatched it recently for uh, Bloody Elbows MMA depressed us. mm -hmm. um, It was a fight where you could you could see clearly two things as a as a modern fight fan. You could see one that BJ Penn deserved the win that he had outpointed Frankie Edgar in their first fight Two, that he did not have a consistent way to get that win. Like you can almost see, and this is probably some retrospect and, and, you know, hindsight playing a role here, making me think that I'm seeing more than I am, but it feels after having watched all of their fights now that you can watch the first fight and see that it won't work a second time. Like Mm -hmm. you can see it as BJ Penn's last great moment. And it just, nothing ever worked out really that well for him again after that. Yeah. I mean, it was like watching the future. Sure. Yeah. In that fight was you could see very clearly pr- the precise limitations of BJ's game and how it was going to be limited yeah. moving forward. And maybe it's because BJ, as I said many times, has always been this reactive guy, he likes to counter you that left hook coming in, uh, taking your back off, uh, off of his back and all of that, defending your takedowns. Everything's reactive, defensive, countering. Maybe it's that it was a fight in which BJ clearly won the first portion, but Frankie Edgar was the one who because the way he approached fighting in general was able to out adapt him by the end of the fight. Yeah. BJ was never a big strategy guy. Yeah. That's and, clear. and MMA starting in around 2009, 2010 became to a much greater extent, a strategist sport. And it turned into even more of one in 2011 and 2012 when five round main events became common. Yeah. Like as soon as five round main events became the norm, right at the end of 2011, uh, the sport really changed, and I still don't think we appreciate the extent to which it changed around that time. Um, does that make sense at all? Like that suddenly you had to think a lot harder about you. Cardio came to matter even more. All of a sudden, if you look at like average fight metric numbers for strikes landed per fight, it starts to tick up in 2011 and 2012, mm-hmm. um, and has, has continued to tick up. I think it's kind of leveled off now, but like all of a sudden fighters were in better shape. They were throwing more, they were landing more, they were doing more offensively. There were more layers to what was happening. Um, Fighters in five round main events, all of a sudden they had to think about what am I gonna do in the early rounds? What am I gonna do in the late rounds? Um, When is the best time to try and finish? How do I win rounds? Like the the whole kind of context of the sport changed. And that was what BJ ran into more than anything. MMA gamesmanship was born around that time. And BJ Penn was just, he's game, but he's just not a gamer. You know, he's not yeah. playing the game. He's not playing the rules. He's not in there min-maxing and trying to figure out the smartest way to beat his opponent. He is just in there, you know, just, being, scrap. just scrapping. Yeah, just scrapping. And that's what, that's what you love about BJ Penn, but it's also why 
this it, this sport is not for him anymore. I don't yeah. think. I mean, but so let's talk a little bit about Yair Rodriguez because we talked a lot about BJ. Um, what do you see in Rodriguez moving forward? What kind of talent do you think he is, Connor? Um, I got to be honest, man. I, I really thought he was going to be exposed a little bit in that fight with Alex Caceres. And maybe it has something to do with the fact that he's still just 24 and a 30-year-old Yair Rodriguez wouldn't be able to do that and everything. But I swear, halfway through that fight, I saw him slipping and starting to slow down, and it just never came to fruition. He he's he's such a crazy athlete, and not just his ability to measure distance and explode, um, and all of these things we usually talk about with athletes, but his his ability, you know, the the Diaz style of athleticism, to just keep going while doing all of this crazy stuff that we know takes a lot of energy to do, is unreal, and um, we've already heaped praises on his his ability to like mix up his kicks and and move from side to side and constantly make his opponent chase him and, and use the takedowns, uh, reactive takedowns to really cement that style. There are still holes there. Like a lot of the punches he threw against Caceres were really ugly. Uh, these lunging, awkward punches that he throws from kicking range because that's where he's comfortable. Um, but, you know, I was I came away impressed more than anything. Maybe it's because I, ex I expected at, at a, after a certain point in the fight that I would see what I expected to see from Yair Rodriguez. I would I would see the disappointment that I almost hoped that I would see, and I didn't. I saw a guy who continued fighting, who actually used his jab really well through the latter portion of the fight, who didn't gas out, and who stayed smart. You know, he didn't go crazy when he couldn't get that finish. So uh, I saw discipline. I saw athleticism. I have pretty high hopes for Rodriguez going forward after that last bout. It's hard to overstate how athletically gifted Rodriguez is. He is one of the best pure athletes, I think, in the UFC uh, in terms of his, like there, it's rare to find a guy with his build who has that kind of explosiveness, Yeah, you know, that kind of speed that like, that is a rare combination of attributes to have is size relative to your division plus uh, absolutely outstanding speed explosiveness. He's, he's, he seems to be pretty strong too. Like he's not a physically, yeah. um, he's not like one of those tall guys where you lock up and all of a sudden, it's like you can push them around. You, you can know? fold like, them in half. Like, all the, he's more like John Jones. Yeah, exactly. Um, he's got he's got leverage, and he knows how to use his leverage in kind of a natural way, which, when combined with with pretty good technique, makes him a lot stronger than you'd think he is. Um, I still think if he if you were to lock up with like a monstrous dude like Mirsad Bektic or something, he'd kind of get tossed around. Yeah, but that's true of just about everybody that Mirsad yeah. Bektic would lock up with. True. Um, he's. It's hard to evaluate fighters like Rodriguez simply because what they're doing is so unorthodox and it feels so new. Like, there has never been a guy who tries to fight the way that Yair Rodriguez does with that mixture of kicks, athleticism, and cardio. You yeah. know? Like, normally when guys try to do this, would th try to throw that many kicks, that variety of kicks, they're going to gas out. Um or they're not that fast, right? So you can always so after they throw, you can get in on you can get in on them. Or if they want to play that game, they don't have the kind of clinch game that Rodriguez does. It's a weird mixture of skills, and it feels like I don't know if it's replicable for anybody else, but it's hard to evaluate and figure out how it works simply because it's so different. Yeah, and 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 I almost wonder is. Is Caceres a smartly put together fighter? Does he have a clear strategic gamers approach to winning fights? Or is he kind of just a new BJ Penn? Do you mean Rodriguez or Rodriguez, sorry, yes. Is Rodriguez sort of the new BJ Penn? Is he kind of going in there and just doing what he wants and just being so gifted at it that he can get away with it? I mean, obviously the base of of his skill set. Um, if you can call it strategy, the sort of strategy he brings into every fight, which is, you know, like this is how these tactics fit together. That is better suited to this era of MMA than BJ Penn's. But it doesn't really feel like Yair Rodriguez goes into every fight with a specific and changing idea of how best to beat each opponent according to their strengths versus his strengths. It kind of feels like he goes in there and just does Yair Rodriguez. And is maybe that why this fight is interesting. It's like the old generation of super athletic, dynamic fighter versus the new generation of that kind of fighter. 
That's a really good point. I hadn't quite thought about it in those terms. I do think he's mostly going out there and doing Yair Rodriguez. Right. And so is that the thing that will eventually be his downfall, is when he faces well, someone who's really process-driven and who is who approaches th- every opponent with a very specific idea of what they need to do to beat them? Yeah, I think that that's probably the way that you beat Yair Rodriguez is just by sticking to a game plan over and over and yeah. over again. The game plan being, I'm going to pressure him. I'm going to get inside. Um, the moment he throws, I'm going to. that's going to trigger my counters. I'm going to kick the shit out of his legs. Like, you would need somebody who could stick to that kind of plan. I think there are a number of fighters who could do that in that division. Mm-hmm. Like, um, I think Jose Aldo could could do something like that. I know Conor McGregor could do something like that. There are a lot of dudes who... Even maybe after that Duha Choi fight, like Cub Swanson might be a tough test for Yair Rodriguez if he's willing yeah. to come forward and trade. Yeah, that's a really that's a really good point. Like, I think Cub Swanson could absolutely be a difficult match, especially because Cub can counter. Yeah. And counter punch, really, and counter punch pretty well. Cub, Cub is flexible, but he can bite down and brawl if he needs to. Yeah, and I think that that's the worst kind of fight for Rodriguez, is somebody, is somebody in that vein. Sure. Now... Or at least, but this is kind of the difficulty with Rodriguez is somebody like that would have been the would have been a bad matchup for him five months ago, right? But we don't know if that kind of fighter is going to be a bad matchup for the Rodriguez who shows yeah. up in January because he's such a crazy athlete and because right. he's getting so much better. And even then, you know? we, we talk about we talk about um, matchups generally as if you know, like what's a favorable match favorable matchup, what isn't. We usually talk about that as if it's an equal playing field, but it's really not for Rodriguez. Um, You know, if you if we are arm wrestling and I have terrible technique, but I'm, you know, 100 pounds heavier than you, it doesn't matter if I have that innate physical advantage. Um, And for Rodriguez, you know, what is the what's the threshold where his athleticism can't save him from not necessarily being the smarter or more better put together fighter? Yeah, see, I don't think it's necessarily that he's not a smart fighter. I think it's that he hasn't had to fight strategically sure, yet. Sure, right. He hasn't even learned like, those lessons. But at what point will he have to? Because he's not, so not athletic. In this fight. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, that's the feeling I, mean, I get too. Yeah, I think that. So, what's your prediction here, Connor? How do you think this goes? Oh, uh, boy. Well, I think Rodriguez will win. We've we've pretty much covered that base uh, pretty thoroughly. I guess I think Rodriguez will. Um, I think he'll, he may knock Penn out late because BJ is very, very tough, very durable, but he's always been a guy who doesn't take a sustained beating that well. He tends to get tired. He kind of loses confidence when he can't get anything done. I think maybe like a third round TKO, and if not that, then like a retirement on the stool from BJ, um, unless he comes in like he did against Frankie, in which case first round KO because <laughs> holy shit, that was bad. What about you, Pat? Yeah. Um, I think I think the same. I think I have a fourth round knockout is what I picked. Yeah. Um, Rodriguez really works the legs and body. And that, if nothing else, should be enough for him to to wear BJ down and put him in he's trouble. Just, so he's it's like being it's weird to see someone who was kind of the same mentally as BJ Penn or similar in the way he approaches fights, but who still feels like such a bad style matchup for him. It's just yeah, like, I mean, I, I don't think we know that we know enough about Rodriguez to say that yet. I, I understand where you're coming from. And I but I think that that is not so much necessarily Rodriguez's underlying personality as it is the confidence of an athletic. Youth. Sure. Yeah, that's fair. So it, it could be. Yeah. But we won't know until we see somebody try to force Rodriguez to fight smart. And whether and and disciplined, we won't know until he has to do that. Yeah, I can't. Any, I I, any I shouldn't make any concrete statements because, like I said, I was shocked at how well he dealt with Caceres, and even even expecting him to beat Caceres. Um, when I saw that moment happen in that fight, where I thought it was starting to slip away, and it just didn't. Rodriguez refused to slow down. And that yeah, that left an indelible mark on me about this young man. So, call, call him a young man. He's two years younger than me. So. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, Yair Rodriguez, late stop, I think sounds about right. And uh, that does it for this segment. When we come back, we will very briefly talk about two other fights taking place on this card. And then at the end of the show, a couple of questions from our listeners. All of that after this. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to this week's Heavy Hands. If you like what you hear, please consider pledging to support the podcast on Patreon. Patreon is basically continuous crowdfunding. You sign up to contribute a certain amount per month to help us with production costs and the like, and in return you get rewards ranging from a mention on the Heavy Hands website to a question or topic of your choice being discussed on the show. 
We have a lot more in the works to reward you for your help, and we appreciate every contribution. No amount is too small. Just head over to patreon.com and find how you can help out the only show dedicated to the finer points of face punching. Now let's get back to it. And welcome back to Heavy Hands. Two other fights on this card caught our interest. If um, our earlier comments about the lower half of the card being terrible were any indication, you may have already guessed that these fights come from the main card. They are, in fact, the top three fights that uh, we do want to talk about. The first one being a lightweight clash between Joe Lozon and Marcin Held, and then a welterweight contest, or should we say an honorary middleweight contest between... Court McGee and Ben Saunders. Let's start off with the lightweights. Lozon held. What is your take on this fight, Pat? I love how similar these two guys are. It's like they matched up exactly the same guy at kind of different stages of their career with slightly different uh, physical uh, characteristics, Mm. but the exact same mindset of go out there, try and finish as early as possible. And if that doesn't happen, well, then I'm probably going to be in trouble. (laughs) Like that's they're They're both too aggressive for their own good. And that's what makes them fun fighters and fighters worth watching. Um, But it's also their downfall. So I I enjoy that particular aspect of this. They are essentially the same guy in that regard Um, with slightly different skill sets, slightly different approaches. Like I think Lozon is faster and more athletic and hits harder. Uh, I think held is um, uh, maybe has a little bit better cardio and, uh, uh, and is maybe a little more creative, but that's it. Yeah, both guys who do not tend to win decisions. In fact, if it goes to the cards, they tend to lose. There definitely are some, as you said, some some specific physical differences. I think Lozon is definitely the more powerful puncher. Um, I think you pointed that out. Marching held definitely a different sort of um, specialization to his submission grappling. But it's the kind of fight where you look at it and you just can't wait to see them tangle with each other. <laughs> like, I can't imagine it not being fun seeing Joe Lozon and Marching Held grappling, both trying. And you know that Joe Lozon, being him, will probably try to take Marching Held's leg after Held tries to wrap up his. <laughs> and you know oh, yeah. we're going to get some kind of insane 50-50 guard leg battle. Uh, it's going to be good, man. I'm, I'm excited for it. Um, Let's talk about Held's most recent fight really quickly to get some framing for this one. He came into the UFC. He fought Diego Sanchez. Not a good person to legitimately lose to at this point in your career. Yeah, Uh, but that was also like, I think in hindsight, and I saw, I I remember thinking about this as I was breaking down the fight, and then I changed my pick at the last minute. I was about to pick Sanchez because I thought if there's a guy that even the 2016 version of Diego Sanchez should go out there and beat, it's marching held. Isn't that, that funny? Like, I'm sorry. Isn't that funny? Because I I I did this. I I had the same thought about Joe Lozon when Diego Sanchez fought him, and it turns out the deciding factor is that Joe Lozon can hit really hard. Um, yeah. But I thought, oh, Diego, he's pretty much never been knocked. He's never been knocked out. He's, he was he was cut by BJ Pan, but he's never been knocked unconscious. And Joe Lozon really only wins when he gets a quick finish. So Diego Sanchez is going to beat him. And then Joe Lozon knocked him out. And then I, that was the thing that made me say, all right, even though I think he's kind of a bad matchup for Marcin Held, I've now lost all hope in Diego. So I'm picking Marcin Held. So that's, that's why I picked, uh, that's why I picked Diego against Lozon and I picked Held against. Same here. Same here. Yeah. Like, no, I think we had, so we had the exact same thought. The failings of the MMA analyst game. (laughs) Yeah, well, you but you can. I think what's important is that we make clear what our thought process was because I yeah. think that's a logical way of of looking at this stuff. Now, held as it turns out has all of Lozon's disadvantages, what, but without the ability to finish a fight on the feet. So, what does that mean for this fight, Connor? How do you see this fight between Lozon and Held playing out? Man, I I, I kind of think it means Joe Lozon wins. Mm-hmm. Um. You know, I, I think Joe Lozon is a good enough wrestler to, to dictate a lot of the takedown game. And, it, I mean, there's with a fight like this, there's an option that both guys submit each other. You know, it, both guys are submission specialists, but it's not like either one has never been tapped. Um, they're both so aggressive that they, in fact, frequently tend to put themselves in some dangerous positions. So that could happen. 
And it could be that marching held's leg lock specialization is not something that Lozon is 100% comfortable with the way he is. But I would be surprised if Lozon couldn't hang with Held and Held couldn't hang with Lozon in most submission, uh, most areas of expertise on the ground. So then it comes down to like innate physical advantages. And marching Held is in this unfortunate position where he's, he's a lot like Joe Lozon. But... I don't think he has a lot of advantages to replace those of Lozon's that he doesn't have. You know, he doesn't mm-hmm. have Lozon's power. Um, what does he have instead? You know, it's not like he has amazing stamina or incredible. He's a speed. little more creative with his submissions. I yeah, guess. maybe like he's he's a little more he's maybe a little more dangerous on the mat. Yeah, and maybe last year I would have said a little more strategic in the way he approaches fights. Like he mitigates yeah. the limited to first round wins way of fighting. But boy, was that Diego Sanchez fight a bad look, man. Like he mm-hmm. he he didn't it wasn't just, oh, it's bad to lose to Diego. He kind of he he looked like he was trying to give that fight away by the end where he just yeah. kept going to the ground over and over. Even though he was beating Diego in the striking, he just wouldn't not <laughs> grapple with him. So he couldn't even th- he doesn't even have like more clear thinking approach to fighting than Joe. So. Yeah. And, and like I think when Lozon loses, it's basically because he gets tired. Yeah. Right. And, but Lozon is, doesn't fight stupid. Like you can never look at a Lozon fight and say, why did he do this thing? That was a dumb thing to do. It's more like, okay, he's tired. He doesn't have anything left in the tank. That's, that's probably that. Like you would expect at this point. And I was thinking about this as I was watching the tape of Lozon against Jim Miller. At this point, you would expect Lozon to start showing some wear. And maybe he is a little bit because he's been in the game for quite a while uh, he's, he's been in a lot of different wars over the years. Like you would expect him to start showing some age. I don't think he's really showing that much age. Not I think ton. he still looks kind of like the same dude that he did a couple of years ago. And barring a major physical decline, I expect him to take out held in that regard. Cause held is a bad defensive fighter kind of in every phase. He's got bad takedown defense. He gets hit a lot on the feet. Um, and on the mat, you can take advantage of his aggressiveness. I expect Lozon to win this, but I think it's going to be fun as hell. Yeah, I, the thing about Lozon aging is really interesting because obviously his record suggests that he's lost more frequently in the past few years than he did before that, but it's not a huge difference. He was always kind of a win-loss guy just because of his style, and and maybe you could say it has something to do with the fact that he fought Jim Miller and Diego Sanchez in his last fight, but... And so maybe he's fighting like a lower level of athleticism, so he's, he's getting a chance to look better than he really is. But Marching Held was largely outstrengthed, out-athleted by Diego Sanchez. He's not an amazing athlete himself. Yeah, no, I don't think he's... I think he's at best an average athlete. Yeah, and so even if it's a bit of a, a, a bit false that Lozon looks so good late in his career, the circumstances surrounding that, that false that falsehood should still hold up here. He should still be okay against Held. So it's weird. It feels like Held came to the UFC with momentum. Um, he had some expectation of being, if not a contender, you know, an interesting top 10 fighter. And now we're picking him to lose to the guy who probably won't get into the top 10 again <laughs> in his career. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, which, yeah. you know, similar to the Diego Sanchez fight, but... It's actually pretty fascinating to me uh, to see Joe Lozon continue to get wins, and I will be very interested whether he does or doesn't in this fight because, like you said, should be a lot of fun to watch. Yeah, he's one. Of, he's always been one of my favorite guys to watch. I love watching Joe Lozon fight. So, um, yeah, props to him. I, I hope he sticks around forever. But So what, what else do we want to talk about? Real quick, do you want to talk about Sergio Pettis? Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah, I forgot about Sergio. Let's talk about – do you want to talk about McGee Saunders at all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The honorary middleweight fight. Which a fight that is at welterweight, but really should be like one and a half pounds over the limit just so that it's technically a middleweight bout. It's, 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 it's like the, it's a, it's a matchup of expendable, what the UFC sees as expendable, um, card fillers. But I think it actually should be pretty entertaining. Court McGee is not a great finisher. He doesn't have a ton of that dynamism that the UFC usually likes in their finishers. But he typically comes to fight every single time. He's typically aggressive, throws at a high rate, mixes up his attacks well, and gets hit enough to keep things interesting. And then Ben Saunders is like the prototypical action fighter where he has 
no semblance of defense and is actually pretty easy to hurt, doesn't have a great chin, but is also extremely dangerous with his own strikes, whether it's his kicks and his knees uh, or his grappling on the ground. First guy, first and only guy still to uh, finish an omoplata inside the octagon. So it should be a fun fight. To me, it feels like the dynamism of Ben Saunders is kind of the saving grace. Mm-hmm. And that the ability to actually finish someone, you know, and I'm and I'm not really confident that Court McGee is ever going to be the Court McGee he was before his knee injury, because yeah. he's increasingly lately he has either been uh, the worst athlete in a really marked way, or he's had to really come in and try to f- quote unquote fight smart to beat his opponents, like in the fight with Dominic Steele. In which basically, or the fight with Ponce Nibio, which basically means he's he's not um, he can't mix it up with his opponents anymore. He has to go only to his area of absolute strength. And unfortunately for Court McGee, that usually means trying to out wrestle his opponents. And he's not an amazing wrestler. So yeah, and it's not even that he's not an amazing wrestler. Like because I think technically speaking, once he gets in on your hips, he's pretty technically sound. Yeah. It's that he doesn't do a good job of setting up his shots, which is partially because he's so slow. Yeah, very mechanical, very stiff with his setups. Yeah, it's hard for him to get in a position to use that wrestling game. I think that's what we see from him as much as anything. Sure, yeah. But, yeah, I'm, I'm basically in agreement with you. I love watching both of these dudes. And Court McGee will always have a soft spot in my heart because that was, uh, like, one of the first seasons of The Ultimate Fighter that I was, like, stoked for. Mm. It was also, I think, when The Ultimate Fighter really started to go downhill <laughs> after the heavyweight season. Um but so I will, I will always have a soft spot in my heart for Court McGee. I, I enjoy him. I enjoy his game. I enjoy watching him. Um, he's uh, he's one of he's a, a guy I've always enjoyed, and I love Ben Saunders too. But Ben is just a little more violent, and I think if McGee is kind of showing the wear at this point, mm-hmm. then that's then that probably edges to Saunders. But real quick, Sergio Pettis, man, what do we think of Sergio Pettis? He's flying under the radar a little bit after he had those losses to Caceres and then Ryan Benoit. But um, he's but he's one of the younger up and coming fighters at 125 pounds. Sergio Pettis is a tiny, super young Ryan Bader. He's he's fallen into that status where now the fans who were excited when he made his debut or when he had his first big win have lost interest because he's had two really what seemed like really damning losses to Ryan Benoit and Alex Caceres. Um, and just like Ryan Bader, he's secretly better than I think the, the the majority of fans give him credit for and is still improving and still finding better ways to beat his opponents. And unlike Ryan, fortunately for Sergio, he's only 23. He has so much more time to develop, provided he doesn't get destroyed um, and, and really thrown off track at any time soon. He's got at least five years to continue developing and, and, and consistently growing as a fighter. So... I am still really excited about Sergio Pettis. I still have my eye on him every time he fights. And um, I've been pretty impressed with his recent performances. He is, he's kind of everything his brother is not. Right. As a fighter, which is, which is an interesting dynamic, you know, like Anthony is super dynamic, a finisher of epic proportions, um, can finish you on the feet, can finish you on the mat, incredible killer instinct, can sense the moment and Mm -hmm. go for it. Um, Like, that's what defines his brother's game and what defines Sergio. While he's still a good athlete, while he's still quick, while he still has has a little bit of pop, like, Sergio is just a really sound, process-driven fighter. He's got good footwork. Uh, He puts together good, clean, technically sound combinations. Uh, He can wrestle. He... He, he can she can work from top position. He can work from his back. Like he may not blow you out of the water on the ground, but he's just really skilled and tight and competent. Doesn't really make a lot of mistakes. He he, he is like a non eye catching version of his brother. Um, yeah. And I think that may actually be the best thing for him because time and again, whenever we have talked about Anthony Pettis, because Sergio and Anthony have similar skill sets. You know the, the areas in which they feel strong. They have their guard games. Their kickboxing. Uh, the range in which they like to fight. Those are all pretty similar. But we've talked time and again about Anthony Pettis, and and, and it always seems to come down to he's a victim of his athletic ability. He's a victim of how dangerous he is, to the point where the little interstitial pieces of his game have never developed because he has never felt he needs them. Um, The way other fighters who aren't insanely gifted need fundamentals Pettis has often got away with ignoring them to the point where now late in his career when he desperately seems to need them they're not there for him 
And Sergio is a fighter who lacks that one aspect of Sir, of Anthony Pettis's game that, yes, while it may not make him a star, um, and he may have some other flaws of his own that will hold him back in other ways, and we can get to that in a moment, He, the lack of that dynamism, I think, is what makes him uh, – is, is probably – or I mean, it's just a theory, but has probably led to him being the more technical, more precise, more thoughtful fighter. Yeah, there's also some weird stuff about his about Anthony's relationship with Duke Rufus and how Duke is simultaneously incredibly hard on Anthony and, and incredibly easy on him. Yeah, like that. I don't think Sergio has had to deal with quite the same. The way. weird father son dynamic they have going on. Yeah, very strange kind of relationship that the two of them have, and because they're, they're also business partners, like they own a bar together. Anthony and Duke do. That's so weird. like that's a whole other kind of strange dynamic to navigate that I don't yeah. think Sergio needs to worry about as much. But so Sergio's weaknesses. Sergio's weakness, I think, is that when he gets hit, he gets hit really hard. He is not a bad defensive fighter, um, but because he works at a quick pace, because he doesn't mind being in the pocket, he doesn't even really mind exchanging. Like when Sergio gets hit, he tends to get popped. Absolutely like like wipe the grin off your face, popped. Yeah. And I, and I think it's even, I mean, that is obviously one thing that Anthony has is the incredible durability that Sergio lacks. But also, I, to me, it is, I've, I've always gotten this feeling watching Sergio Pettis that he's um, he's not necessarily incredibly fragile or anything, um, but that he kind of lets his foot off the gas in his fights. He seems mm-hmm. to kind of lose focus and kind of zone out for a minute, almost in the way that um, another very technical fighter, much more so than Sergio, but uh, almost in the way that Guillermo Rigondeaux does. I often look at Guillermo Rigondeaux, and I kind of think he's getting bored, like he's going through the motions and nothing is really happening, and he's just uh, picking his opponent apart, and mm-hmm. he gets kind of bored, and his opponent hasn't given up yet, and then they nail him, and he has to suddenly fight for his life. And that's happened in a lot of Rigondeaux fights. Um, oh, Robbie Lawler is kind of the same way. Robbie Lawler is another fighter who kind of seems to get bored and lose focus sometimes. Well, um, so I, I think that the, one of the commonalities there, and this applies to Rigondeaux, this applies to uh, this applies to Sergio Pettis, it applies to Lawler. I think it also applies to guys like Jorge Masvidal um, and Sean Strickland. We've talked about this with yeah. regard to them a little bit. These are all dudes who started fighting grown men when they were kids. Hmm. More or less like Lawler, not quite as much, but Lawler, I mean, started training with pros at Militich when he was like 19, 18 or 19. Yeah. So maybe him too. Like fresh Um, out of high school, I think. Yeah. Or Jose Aldo too. Like if you are fighting grown ass men from the time you are like barely into puberty, I think a lot of the time you can kind of zone out a little bit because you're just doing something that you've done so many times and you know you're surviving and you know you're winning, you know you're scoring. So like your mind wanders a little bit. Yeah. And you try and you think that by like kind of taking your foot off the gas, you are minimizing your risk and guys like Pettis who don't have the best chin in the world when they get hit, like all of a sudden you can find yourself in a lot of trouble. Right. When you you suddenly your opponent doesn't feel, "Oh, I'm, you know, I'm I I can't hit them anymore." Your opponent because your offense has started to dwindle. And because you've started to just kind of play around and float around the cage, suddenly sees that now they can come in and not worry about what's coming back at them. And so you get hit with the hardest shots when you start to zone out. You know, they get more aggressive. That's what happened in the Benoit fight with Lawler. It happened against Condit and against McDonald. And with Rigondeaux, it even happened against, like, um, Amagasa, like a fairly unknown Japanese fighter he faced. And he gets clipped really hard in the eighth round and has to fight to survive. So, yeah, maybe you're onto something there. Maybe you're onto something. But that's what I've always – that's the feeling I've always gotten watching Sergio Pettis. And so for me, it's it's also sort of – it's the difference for him is that he is still young, so he could still mature out of that. I think, um, unlike guys like Lawler, Rigondeaux, who are uh, like very set in their ways at this point, even Miles of it all, um, I get the feeling that Pettis can probably mature out of that, and and probably has made some strides in doing so because he's he's now you know been fighting a reasonable type of competition with mixed results, but with mostly good results, and not been you know getting thrown in there against great fighters too much too soon so now's his big test um john moraga it's the first real big step up he's had in some time um what do you think about the fight just a general prediction um i think this is the ultimate battle of process driven fighter versus opportunist sure yeah and uh or or one of the ultimate battles that we'll see and in that scenario i'm always going to side with the process guy like i think that pettis 
unless he makes a major mistake and kind of lets Moraga onto his neck uh, or does something stupid on the feet, like he's just going to kind of outwork him. In, in exactly like as a high, kind of a higher volume version of what Matthäus Nicolau did to Moraga yeah. earlier this year. Like that's exactly the same kind of matchup, like an athletic, quick, technically sound striker who, who works at a pretty good pace, but who can also wrestle. That's a bad matchup for Moraga, who has gotten by for a long time um, on his ability to find finishes kind of out of the blue. Yeah. And I think that again, barring a major mistake or like a flush shot landing on Pettis, I think, I think Pettis should take it. Yeah. Moraga's in that weird position where it's like, he's had to be a finisher to find success in the UFC. And, and the difficult thing for guys that's like down here at flyweight and bantamweight, you know, we always call featherweight um, Ricardo Lamas an opportunist. It's a term I use a lot for him. We don't call guys who rely on getting quick finishes or sudden finishes opportunists at heavier weights. You know, we call them knockout artists. We call them finishers. We call them dangerous. But down here, they feel like opportunists because they have to be more precise in latching on to every opportunity they see because there are fewer of them. You know, the chances of you buzzing someone with a single glancing blow are a lot smaller down at flyweight. The chances of you getting someone on their back to the point where they have to scramble into a bad position are a lot smaller at flyweight. Everything happens faster and everything, the consequences tend to be lessened. And so opportunists are not really as dangerous as the guys who who have the same trait in heavier divisions. And before that Mateus Nicolau fight, I may have picked Moraga over... Um, I may have picked him over Sergio Pettis, but he actually only has 10 finish wins of 21 total fights. It's not amazing. You know, it's not like yeah. he's in there like defeating or finishing 80% of the guys he beats. And Sergio Pettis, yeah. I think, is growing and is very much capable of fighting a technical fight. The, 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 the question will be if and when Sergio Pettis loses focus. Can John Moraga sneak? Can he steal the win in that moment? And there's a definite possibility. But because the consequences are not as grand down here at flyweight, I think Sergio can probably survive one or two moments like that. Um, yeah. So it's still dicey, but I'm with you. I think Sergio wins a decision. Yeah, I'm there with. I'm right there with you. Uh, so should we head on into our third segment? Let's do it. We'll take one more break, and when we come back, heavy bag questions. Financial support is fantastic, but there are other, even easier ways to support heavy hands. Perhaps the best is by spreading the word. We know our fan base. You're all cool, popular people with serious social media presences. You're tastemakers and trendsetters. Okay, there are one or two of you that don't fit that description. You know who you are. But no matter what, you can always help us out by telling folks about the show. And you can also give us a positive rating and review on iTunes and Stitcher, things like that. We rely on word of mouth and positive feedback to grow and improve. So thank you very much for your time and your help. Now, back to the show. And we are back. As promised, it is time to dip into the heavy bag. So here we go. Our first question this week comes to us from... Lucas Sharp. Uh, Lucas is one of our Patreon patrons. Um, donating $5 or more a month will get you a guaranteed spot on this segment. Lucas asks, um, he's got a long question here. Some of you guys, man, you, you really go on with your examples. Uh, he wants to know about stance switching. Basically, his question boils down to um, what are the disadvantages and how powerful a weapon is stance switching? Basically, Lucas has always imagined it as being a really valuable aspect of a fighter's skill set, but that's not always necessarily the case, and it seems pretty specialized. So how useful is it? Should all fighters learn to do it? And what are the drawbacks? That's a good question. Um, I think there was a point in time where stance switching was very much in vogue in MMA. Um, I think between about 2012 and 2014, stance switching was something everybody was trying to do, uh, in large part because there were a lot of fighters who had done good work with stance switching. I think the the John Jones effect, the Dominic Cruz effect, um, that these were dudes who— Anderson, Lioto. Yeah, both of the both of those guys switch stances a lot. Um, it was it was definitely a thing that seemed like it was in vogue. Mm -hmm. uh, and now we've I think guys are kind of going away from it. Um, it's not quite as common as it used to be. Which, you know, I, 
I don't know. I mean, I think on a basic level, I would say that stance switching is a useful tool to have in your skill set as long as you know why you're doing it and for what purposes you're doing it. Aimless stance switching is a stupid thing and it, and it can get you yeah. in big trouble. Um, but there are, there are times and places where stance switching can help you out. We, we probably have a slightly different views on this, actually, because you're you are you mostly in your training background have done Muay Thai. Um, and I think that's a place where like stance switching is, it's not a huge part of it, but it's at least more forgivable, especially to set up certain strikes. When you're throwing a lot of kicks, you're going to need to change the position of your feet a lot. Um, and me as somebody who really, um, ha my, my love for martial arts kind of came out of my appreciation for boxing. There's not a lot of stance switching in the history of boxing. And so I've kind of had to be convinced over time that it's something that is worth the risks. It's worth doing um, despite the risks. Uh, the risks to me, I mean, the big one for stance switching is that uh, if traditionally fighting is about exposing, this is, this is again, this is a boxing mindset, but traditionally boxing at least is about it's hit and not get hit. It's about consistently exposing your opponent's openings and keeping them from doing the same to you. And so to me, stance switching kind of flies in the face of that, um, or at least it seemed to at one point when I first started thinking about it, because every single time you switch stance, you are giving your opponent an opportunity. And even if you're very quick, you are giving them a pretty wide window of time in which if they hit you, your stance will not be there to save you. You are between stances, and so therefore you're off balance and will have a harder time absorbing a strike. There are, of course, ways to mitigate that, and we will talk about that, fighters who do that really well. But that is what always struck me as being the big drawback of relying on stance switching as a key part of your style. So I think, yes, to some extent. I think that the demands of MMA in terms of space and timing and angles and things of that nature make stance switching more useful than in boxing. Yeah. There are a few boxers who, who switch stances and do it fairly well. Um, I think Terrence Crawford is the best example of that. Like Crawford is lethal from both stances. Nowadays, um, yeah. Marvin Hagler may be the best example ever. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There, there, are, there are definitely some good stance switchers in boxing. Uh, Mike Tyson. I mean, there are some great stance switchers mm -hmm. in boxing, but it's not as common and it's not a traditional way of boxing. So I think it, Tyson is probably the best analog for how MMA fighters use stance switches, yeah. which is to help you cover distance uh, because the distances are so much longer in an MMA fight um, than they are in boxing because you're required to do more things with your feet. Um, not necessarily better, but you've got you've got more ground to cover. You've got different ranges that you have to be at. Stance switching is a useful tool to allow you to cover those. So um, guys who do a lot of blitzing, attacking combinations, stance switching is really useful for that. Which if you've got to cover half the distance of the cage to, to pin your opponent against the fence, like stance switching is really useful for, to help you do that because you can cover ground faster than you could otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, also for kicks, I think that um, there are some guys who feel more comfortable kicking out of one stance than another. Yeah. And for them, stance switching can be a really useful tool. Cub Swanson, I feel much more... Alistair Overeem, the southpaw kickers of MMA. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and there are a fair few guys like this who are more comfortable yeah. uh, kicking out of one stance than another. Um, I feel a lot more comfortable throwing a rear power shot in southpaw than I do in orthodox. That's just me mm. personally. Yeah. Um, I don't like throwing like straight right hands. I have never felt particularly comfortable throwing them. Um, I love the straight left. I will throw the straight left early and often like combination punching, like going from from one hand to another feels much more comfortable for me in southpaw than it does in orthodox. Right. Yeah. And then so, there's there's the matter of um, closing distance when you're already close to the opponent to help you take yep. really deep angles. I mean, we see guys like TJ Dillashaw, Dominic Cruz do that where they're taking these deep steps into the opposite stance, these shifting steps where they take an angle to the point where they're actually behind behind their opponent, which is great, um, not only for striking, but for all the avenues opened up by wrestling in MMA that boxing does not have. Yeah, exactly. So I think for those purposes, stance switching is more useful. I think um, aimless stance switching is is a different story. Like I got, Uriah Faber to me has always been the quintessential example of this, like where yeah. he'll switch stances and you'll just think to yourself, why? What did that accomplish for you? What? And I think it's done in the name of, well, giving your opponent a different look. Like, really? Have you given them a different look? <laughs> yes. Is, is that? Why do really? they? What, why should they care about this look? Like, what are they? What are you giving them to care about? Yeah, and that that to me is just kind of silly. 
it's rare to have a truly ambidextrous fighter in MMA who can do the same things equally effectively from both stances. Yeah. I think Tarek Safadine is about the only one, but yeah. that's really basically because he just throws a jab, a rear leg power kick, a front leg kick, and and a front and a, and a front hand hook. Yeah, Stephen that's Thompson's maybe throws. close. Um, but it's really, I mean, it's really too. The guys who are who seem pretty ambidextrous are also tend to be the ones who to approach stance switching more the way a boxer like Terence Crawford would, yeah. where it's mm-hmm. it's a, a lot more careful, patient outside. It's the guys who kind of get in there and mix things up tend to be the ones who are more crazy and dynamic with their stance switching. But yeah. uh, or like John Jones is even one who switches stances, but also tends to use that not as a way to take angles and pressure and cover distance, but as a way to get different angles on strikes while he is trying to keep distance. Yeah, exactly. I mean, Jones, I think, uses Southpaw really effectively Mm -hmm. because it gives him even more distance than he would already have between him and his opponent. Yeah. So because because an opposite stance matchup, you're going to be farther away. It's a couple of inches. It's not like a huge amount of space, but it's enough that if you're trying to maintain distance is a really useful thing for you. So... So there's that. I mean, that's that's kind of my take on it. I think it's a useful tool, probably got overused in MMA for a while. But those who do it well and know what they're trying to do with it, it's an extremely yeah. useful. Thing. I, I do want to say um, treating treating the fact that you can get hit while switching stances is not uh, the end of the world and does not make it not useful, because that would also say that that would also mean like there's no reason you should ever throw a lead right you know, or, or whatever, or an uppercut from a long distance or, you know, so on and so forth. There are a million reasons not to do a million different things when the guy in front of you is trying to knock you out. Um, so that doesn't end it. And the way that guys like TJ Dillashaw and Dominic Cruz mitigate those risks is by giving their opponents something to deal with and look at while they're changing stances. Dillashaw is probably the best at this, just constantly reaching and touching and pawing and giving you things to react to and blocking your vision while he takes his angles, you know, always attacking with both hands, doubling up from each hand. Um, But it is still a risk and you do still see guys um, now and again being knocked out the way Aldo was when he fought Conor McGregor, trying to throw a shifting, jumping left hook. That kind of thing does happen. Um, Leota Machida knocking out Ryan Bader, trying to shift his way forward with a punching combination. You're always going to be more vulnerable when you shift, but it doesn't mean it's, you know, my, my, the way I originally thought about this, I would say now is wrong. That there, it, it's good to be open minded about stance switching, but also to think about it carefully and not just think about it as a thing that fighters are supposed to do. Because it's, it's, I think the idea, like, give, when people say, um, stance switching is, you know, so you have something in their, your arsenal that they don't have in theirs. That is very similar to saying you're giving them a different look. It's not enough thought going into that way of looking at it as a tool. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm with that. So, and we had one more question, right? One more. Yeah, this one comes from T Wone 21. He asks, he or she asks, I suppose, not a lot of gender indicators in that name. This podcast is about analyzing fighting but have you guys ever considered in-depth data analytics gathered from fight metric if done right it could give some very interesting insight it could be coupled with your style of analysis very well i.e correlation between strikes attempted and decisions won etc so basically um have we considered or do we ever use statistical analysis as part of our more narrative freeform style of analyzing fights yeah, so I, I think the answer for me is I do use them. Yeah, same here. Like regularly uh, for a lot of different things. I don't think that it is so. I, let me take a step back here. So what fight metric gives you is data. Yeah. How you interpret that data is it is an entirely different story. Just looking at the numbers and saying, well, this guy lands more strikes than this other guy, is is not particularly useful looking at the takedown per, takedown defense percentage and saying like oh well this means he's a great offensive wrestler or a great defensive wrestler or looking at uh striking defense and saying well this guy is obvi- obviously has great striking defense if his if it's above this percentage like you have to dig into the numbers and try and figure out exactly what they're measuring mm-hmm. that's the that's and only once you figure that out are they actually useful for you to use yeah. in kind of a holistic sense as, as a means to analyzing a fight. Numbers, so, the numbers gathered can tell you everything and nothing. The same numbers. They can yep. be incredibly – I mean really what we do is not all that different from what a statistician does or somebody who does data analysis. The difference is just that they look only at numbers. But really the art of the statistician, uh, the, the job of, the, of a statistician is to – 
find the correct narrative in the numbers is to identify which which things are real causation and which things are merely correlation uh, or, or or so you know whichever way you want to look at it which and, things are really um of significance and which things are not and to find i mean yeah it's finding the narrative in the data but it's also finding the it's also accurately measuring the data that tells and that tells a story right like you know, so so when I'm looking at fight metric numbers, I always as I'm writing my preview articles, I always have fight metric open. I'm always looking at the, yeah. I'm always looking at the statistics, but I may dig deeply, right? So I may look at I may look at okay, what percentage of head strikes is landing against this guy? So because you may see, oh, this guy has uh, this guy's defense uh, striking defense is sixty percent. That's like a fairly it's it's above average, right? And to me, 60% probably says this guy likes to operate at range. Um, probably it may get hit a little bit too much coming in or may get hit too much in the, or may spend too much time in the clinch where it's, where you can land a higher percentage of strikes. So if I look at that number, I'm going to go back and I'm going to look at, okay, what percentage of strikes are landing at range? And if that, per, and if it's still 60%, then that's a bad defensive fighter. If you're standing at distance and your opponent is still landing 60% of his or her strikes, then you're not moving your head enough. It's and especially if many of those are head strikes, you're not moving your head enough. You don't know how to check kicks. Like your opponent should not be landing that percentage of strikes if you tend to operate at range. Yeah. So you've got to dig into the numbers and, and you've got to get granular with it because the basic percentages that are or, or raw numbers that are listed at the top of the profile are not going to tell you all that much. Right. Like it's only once you start to dig into them that you see what it is they're actually capturing and only then are they useful for you. Yeah. And my, my point before is, is that was that, um, the, the, it's how you use the numbers and that the numbers alone are not really all that powerful. You know, it's great to have the data collected and like Pat, I look at fight metric all the time when working on previews and articles and I often have it open when we do this show and you'll often, I think we've probably mentioned it a lot of times in the last few episodes, us running around to try and figure out what a certain statistic is or so on and so forth. But, um, you know, for example, I mean, the easiest example is to look at a fight like Condit Lawler and to pretend like those numbers give you an easy argument for Carlos Condit winning that fight. And in that sense, without context and without looking at the actual fight footage to back it up, the numbers really don't tell you anything. You know, they all they tell you nothing but what they tell you on the surface. You can't imply anything from those numbers. You can't imply who hit harder, whose shots were cleaner, who's landed in the right time in the right round. If you just look at this guy landed 147 and this guy landed 98, so 147 wins, that is a a terrible way to use statistics. And for, so for me, I've always been out there soldiering basically against statistics being used in that way. When somebody points out how somebody outlanded him in every round or whatever, it's, it's all to me, that is a dire misuse of statistics to, to prove a very simple point um, by, by inferring all of these different things. So statistics, very valuable, very useful. I love that they're being collected. I would love to see more statistics and have more things to use in my analysis uh, but ooh, they have their limitations. And that is, in fact, the sign that it is time to end the show. Wouldn't you agree, Pat? Um, that is the sound we have all been waiting for. So thank you guys for tuning in to this edition of Heavy Hands, episode 141. I'm not going to forget episode 141. Uh, we really appreciate it. A bonus episode will have come out this week, and that'll be the Handies, our year-end awards. So go and check that out. We got a nice, long, in-depth discussion about all of our favorite fighters in various categories, including, you know, best striker, um, best submission artist, best fight, best performance, so on and so forth. Um, fighter to watch in 2017. There was a lot of good discussion in that episode. So check that out if you haven't already. And uh, Pat, what are you working on this week? Um, not too much MMA related. I'll have a preview of this Rodriguez Penn fight night out on Wednesday on Bleacher Report. But otherwise, I'm only working on other projects. So you have a new I podcast, have... right? I'm sorry? You have a new podcast coming out. Yeah, I do. Um, so I have, well, I'll have an episode of Fall of Rome coming out later this week. But then, yeah, I'll have a, a new podcast that I'm doing with a historian friend of mine named Keith Plymers. Keith is wicked smart, one of the smartest people I know. Um, called The new show is called History Matters. We're talking about current events in historical depth and detail. Mm. So um, the 
topic for the first episode is the narrative of progress, the idea that technologically speaking and socially speaking, things are getting better all the time, that the quality of life is rising. And basically, that narrative is wrong. Um, <laughs> it is wrong in a whole bunch of different ways. And it's both and it's pretty misleading in terms of how it gets deployed. So we explore where that narrative comes from, how it gets utilized and what it obscures. Episode so one, think, why you are correct to be a curmudgeon. Yeah, basically, or just, just to be a pes- or just to be a pessimist in general. Yeah, um, episode one, like, they really were the good old days. Well, they were the good. Well, good for whom? I think is the real okay, question. Yeah, there you go. Progress for whom? And that's those are the the real things that that narrative obscures. Is like you talk about being on the right side of history. Well, really, I the mean, the right side of history a, is always the wrong side of history for a different group. Yeah, exactly. So that's uh, so that's what we get into in that first episode. But yeah, new episode of the fall of Rome, too. Or I'll be talking about uh, the late Roman army um, and how it differed from the earlier Roman army. And that's about it. So not too much this week. Not too much. Just a whole new podcast, an episode of an already very successful podcast, and then an in-depth look at MMA. <laughs> so pretty easy <laughs> week for the good old Patrick Wyman. Uh, it's going to be a pretty easy week for me, which basically means don't expect anything. I'm, I have a lot of things I'm working on right now, but I'm just going to wait till they come out to let you see them. Some year-end stuff I have in the works. Uh, that uh, Nunez Aldo piece I mentioned, still working on it. It's a long one. Um, and then I'm working on some scouting reports and stuff on the side. So uh, we'll see. We'll see what comes out this week. But keep your eyes peeled and keep them stuck to the places where you can find our respective pieces of work. Uh, I do Sherdog previews at Sherdog.com. I will have one coming out this week on uh, Rodriguez versus Penn. Pat does his previews of the entire cards over at Bleacher Report. Of course, we both do heavy hands. We have the bonus episodes. $3 a month gets you access to two bonus episodes every single month. So I consider that quite a bargain. And then you got my work on Bloody Elbow, Pat's other work on Bleacher Report, plus the podcast's everything so check out everything we've ever done and in your spare time make sure to tell your friends about heavy hands and thank you very much for listening today get at us on social media find us on twitter i'm at boxing bush it's b-u-s-c-h pat is at patrick underscore wyman and um heavy bag people on patreon send us your questions we only have a couple here and we we need some more so if you guys who have pledged five dollars a month have more questions please send us send them our way we will answer them soon and uh, try to get through as many as we can in the coming weeks Thank you for listening, everybody. And of course, if you came here for the finer points of face punching, you have been listening to the right show. This has been Heavy Hands.